I'm Awa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And Brandon Taylor, listen, if you're not following him on Twitter, if you're not following him on, on Instagram, please just go do that and come back and listen to the rest of the show. The Late Americans is his new novel. Um, it follows Filthy Animals, which won the Story Prize in 2022. It's a terrific collection. If you haven't read that, go pick it up. Pretty much everyone knows Brandon, though, from Real Life, which is his debut. It was shortlisted for the Booker, among many other awards, and it is lovely, and we all know Wallace, but I really want to focus on the late Americans because I am in love with this book. Brandon, it's so good to see you. Thank you for joining us on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's finally, we're making this happen, a dream come true. Well, I hope so. <laughs> okay, more importantly, the late Americans. I do want to start with the title because it comes up in a couple of different places in this book, and I really love the title and I love how it comes about. Would you just explain it before you and I go diving into stuff? Sure. Yeah. So the, the title, The Late Americans, came about for a couple different reasons, one of which was when I was an MFA student, I, I remember sitting in the seminar one day trying to think of, you know, like classic titles. And I kept coming back to Henry James, who's one of my favorite authors, and he has this great novel called The American. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking like, man, that makes such a great title for something. But like Henry James has like already used it. And around the same time, I was getting really frustrated with a lot of the what felt like like received ideas about art and literature that were sort mm -hmm. of dominating the discourse both in public life and um, in conversations among my classmates and cohort mates and it all started to i guess like cohere and collide and i was like man someone should write a novel about this exact moment in <laughs> in our lives and, and i was like yeah we can call it like the late americans to sort of describe this weird moment of various social <laughs> factors <laughs> coming together. And so then I was like, oh, that's a perfect title. I'm going to use that. I'm going to run with it. I'm going to, I'm going to write a novel called The Late Americans. So it opens in a seminar classroom at a graduate school that feels like it's in the Midwest somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My, my turf. <laughs> yeah, right? Okay. And we meet Seamus who I didn't quite know what to make of this guy but let's just say he pulls the proverbial pin on a verbal hand grenade is that a fair thing to say i mean he sort of throws us right in and we're talking about poetry <laughs> is this how the book opened for you though when you sat down to write it because there's a lot of overlap between the late americans and filthy animals which we'll get into as we go but how was it seamus was it this classroom started this book mm -hmm. it was Seamus as it often happens in grad school cohorts there were these two people who did not like each other very much even mm -hmm. though they had so much in common and I mean like right down to their names right. <laughs> were the same name and they were from similar places and I'm just like you know if these two people had met like at anywhere any other place in the world they would probably be really good friends mm -hmm. because they both really care about writing. They're both writers. They, they read the same books. They have the same literary lineage. <laughs> and yet they hate each other here. And I was like, what is it about this place that like provokes this, this, this wild dislike among people with so much in common? And I thought, you know, someone should write a story about that. And so I started writing a story about that. And originally the story was going to be about this like snarky, rude poet <laughs> who's like, you know, who thinks he's like too good for everything, but who like, despite all of his bravado, like he kind of has a point, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, like he says it in exactly the wrong way, but he's like kind of right about some things. And so it began with that character. And, and quickly I discarded the idea of like, you know, he would have this counterpart who he would be in competition with. And it just mainly became about that character and trying to figure out like, what is it like to be in a program and to feel like you're the only one taking it seriously, this thing that you've staked your life on, which is like art and poetry, and the whole world's telling you that that's a silly idea. And even the people who are ostensibly running that race with you also are not taking it as seriously as you imagined. And what's that like? Yeah, the book started with Seamus, but because I had been writing these, a few stories that ended up in my collection, Filthy Animals, Right. right before I wrote this book, I was thinking a lot about Iowa City. And I was like, well, I've already written these stories that take place in Iowa City. I might as well stay here. And so mm -hmm. there's this nice bleeding edge from Filthy Animals 
into the late Americans, I think, in terms of tone and setting, but then it quickly becomes something quite different. Iowa City becomes like a different sort of place, I think. Yeah, no, it definitely does. But at the same time, I really appreciate it because, I mean, I did it backwards this time. So obviously I read you when you come out. But in this particular case, I started with the late Americans and then went back to Filthy Animals just because I kept feeling these echoes. And I was like, Mm. wait, is that me as the reader? But like, there are some beats that are really familiar. And again, also loneliness and desire. And I guess we could call this a coming of age. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, I risk maybe overusing that phrase, but I do think your characters don't know what's necessarily next for them. Even the ones who come from money where you hint, (laughs) you're kind of like, well, no, they'll be fine because they have money. They don't really have to worry about it. It's just really all about the aesthetics. And it's like, actually, not one of them has a (laughs) real clue what they're doing next. And that's really the fun of this book is watching these kids try to figure out, I mean, there's Timo and Fedor and Ivan and Noah Mm. and Fatima and B. Am I missing anyone? We have Seamus. Oh, Bert shows up a couple of times, but he's a townie. He's a Goran, who's the other musician. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So I just want to talk about this because this is a pretty tight cast. And I'm just sort of wondering who showed up when and who did you pull out of Filthy Animals and say, okay, you get a spin here, pal. <laughs> yeah, so it it began with Seamus. And I wrote, at the time, I didn't even really think I was writing a novel. I thought I was writing like episodes okay. in a year and a life in the city. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote Seamus. And then I wrote Theodore. Then I decided I wanted to write theater's boyfriend um because at the time in the very earliest draft of that chapter timo doesn't have a name he's just referred to as like theodore's boyfriend and (gasps) my my workshop teacher was like you gotta give this kid a name i'm sick of i'm sick of this construction you gotta give him a name and so then i was like well maybe i'll write timo Mm -hmm. and so i wrote the timo story and then after that like that features this pornographer named Ivan. And I was like, okay, I've got to do Ivan's story. Right. And Ivan's story had this guy named Noah. And I'm like, well, I got to do his story right. next. And so it became this like relay race character to character. And they kind of, each chapter led to the next one in like a really organic and mm. natural way, I think. But then when I was working on Theodore's story, I thought, oh, I, I really love reusing characters, both mm-hmm. in chapters and stories and also books. And so in this book, I was like, well, Harchis from the yeah, yeah. from Filthy Animals needs to come back and he's going to be the friend who's, you know, in this in this thing that's going to like tie all the books like together. Um, and so I love a like a cinematic universe. Yeah. I love a sort of broader, broader world. But the character is really kind of, you know, each chapter told me who the next one would be about because it just seemed that there was a natural handing off of the narrative to those other characters. And Hartness's name, honestly, is the one that made me go, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not like, <laughs> this isn't Steve. This isn't Michael. This isn't John. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I just had a yeah. moment and that's what sort of made my ears prick up mm. a little bit. Although what's interesting yeah. is that even in Filthy Animals, there's a character from real life in Filthy Animals who no one, who no one really knows about except me. I'm so sorry. I missed it completely. <laughs> no, no, no. And there's a there's um, a sort of mysterious connection between Sophie from Filthy Animals, mm. who's one of these dancers, and one of the characters in real life that nobody has caught on to yet. And so each book has like a little a little Easter egg from the previous book in it. I really love this idea. Now, when you sat down though to create this book, and you're talking about late Americans being a series of vignettes. You don't know if it's going to be a novel or a story collection or whatnot. I think the way time works though in this book, it clearly you know, showed you quickly that it was a novel, but there's a note at the end of the book saying Lee Pace, who I'm assuming is mm. the actor Lee Pace, yes. helped you sort of redefine, because you got stuck at some point. And I'm wondering what that kind of stuck looked like and also how Lee Pace knocked you out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's sort of one of those strange quirks of fate. So mm-hmm. I finished drafting this book in 2019. Okay. We sold it in 2020. You know, it was sort of in a much more intermediate phase when we sold it to my editor. And he was the one who was like, 
where you need to like make a choice here. It's a novel. I think it's a not. I know it's a novel. You just mm-hmm. need to like commit to the bit and like finish, you know, go the last 10 miles or so and make it fully, like fully embrace it as a novel. And so I, I spent from 2020 to, so we sold it in August, 2020. And I spent until June of 2021 trying to like make it cohere. And it just like was not working at all. And I was so miserable. <laughs> like, And the thing is like writing had never really deserted me like that. Like I'd never, you know, like there was never a problem that I couldn't solve. And I was just like nothing but time, patience, craft and technique. I can solve anything. And I could not get it. Like it just didn't feel right. And so in 2021, June of 2021, I resolved that I was going to give up writing and that I was going to take up film photography. And I, I, yeah, Mm -hmm. I stepped away from writing because I just like could not get it to cohere in my mind. It just felt like a series of unattached episodes and I was so miserable and I couldn't write and I felt so deeply stuck. And it was the first time in my life I've ever felt abandoned by writing. And so, yeah, I took up film photography and then I moved to New York City. And my first week in New York City, it was like maybe my third day in New York City, I get this text from my friend, Jeremy, who's a playwright, and he was getting ready for the redo of the Met Gala that had been rescheduled because of COVID, the one that was going to be in like in September or something. And he's like, hey, I'm getting ready at the Carlisle. Do you want to come over and like hang out while I get ready to go to this pre-party for the Met Gala. And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, I just kind of wanted to hang out with my friend, but okay, we can do it in this like very glamorous setting. And so I go to his hotel and he's like, oh, by the way, my friend Lee is coming. And I didn't think anything of it. I'm like, okay, cool. Neat. And so then, you know, knock on the door and like, and walks Lee Pace, who's like so beautiful. Right, Right. And he looks at me and he says, wait, you were the boy on the bench in the park. And I was like, yes, I was on a bench in a park. And he's like, you were reading that book from the Medici exhibit that was at the Met. And I was like, yeah, I, I was on a park bench <laughs> reading this book okay. uh, from the exhibit. And he's like, yeah, I, me, me and my husband saw you this afternoon. And I was like, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so then, of course, Jeremy leaves us. So it's just like me and Lee Pei is just like hanging out on my friend Jeremy's bed, like talking. And, and he's like, so what are you working on? What are you working on? And I was like, I'm not going to bore you by talking about this novel I can't finish. And he's like, no, no, tell me about it. Tell me, I love books. So I tell him, I was like, I'm really stuck though, because like, I can't figure out like why anybody would care about this character. Like, I just can't solve it. And he's like, well, well, like, why? Like, why doesn't anyone care about him? Does he care about himself? Do you care about him? And I was like, well, like, yeah, I care about him, but like readers probably want, he's like such a jerk. And he's like, well, like, why is he a jerk? <laughs> you know, like, right. like, why, why is he a jerk? And he really got me thinking about like, why is Seamus a jerk? And he said this really incredible thing about Juilliard, which is that he said that when he was a student there, the one thing that he felt he'd learned there was how to marshal attention to himself. And I was like, oh, that's what Seamus is doing. Like he is marshaling attention to himself. And like that is a defense mechanism for like a deeply lonely and shy person. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, I think I understand this character now. It seems so obvious now. And it allowed me to like realize like Seamus is just like a shy, anxious, lonely person. And it let me approach him, I think, from a different way that wasn't so, I didn't fall for his prickliness anymore because then I could see like why he was doing it. And I realized that the book couldn't live unless he, you know, was living his ethos, which is he needed a job. I needed to give him a job. (laughs) Yeah, you have a great description of him too early in the seminar where he's being his spiky shameless self, sort of in his own head. He's going on about how he knows that what he's doing right in that moment is performance. It is not, in fact, poetry, but it's performance. So that's okay. And I'm like, oh, wow. It's that little catcher in the rye moment, right? Where everyone's a phony but me. And I'm like, okay, let's see where this goes. Mm. let's yeah. see where this goes because i'm curious i because i will freely admit that i was like Ugh, who is this dude and i don't have to like characters to follow them i absolutely like i just want to know but 
the minute I saw that line about, oh yeah, he knows this isn't poetry, he knows it's performance, I'm like, okay, that's a really interesting level of self-awareness for a younger person and I will totally follow. And it mm. uh, completely pays off. Completely, yeah. Completely pays off. Well, the thing is I had to realize like, oh, as the writer, I was just like falling prey to it where I was just mm -hmm. like recreating this dynamic of like, oh, we're all phonies. And I was like, but like, what's more interesting than that is like, what does he think when he goes home at night? Yeah. Like, what does he think when he leaves here? And like, he has no one to perform for anymore, right? Like you have a couple options as the writer. You can sort of keep up that performance. And I think that's kind of boring. Or you can write what happens when a person loses that audience and they got to be alone with themselves. And I'm like, that guy has a job. <laughs> like he, when he leaves this seminar room, he's got to go chop vegetables and like, that's what he's got to do. And I've got to be honest and, and, and real about that. Like that to me was much more interesting than writing this like slick, super smart, like chatty guy. Like I could have kept him in that scene and in that room for like dozens more pages. But like that to me wasn't where the story was. It wasn't as interesting. What's interesting to me is when the person who needs that can't have it because he's been kicked out of class. <laughs> and the way he intersects with other characters in this book to, and not just Bert, and you know, I'm sort of dancing around Bert a little bit because he is <laughs> this very towny guy. And I have to say, he pops up a second time and is like, "Oh man, this guy, okay, <laughs> this guy." And you know, I sort of do love talking about fictional characters like they're actual people, and uh, I do get very sort of visceral reactions to people. But Seamus is kind of, in some ways, this classic like I'm going to stand on the edge of the world kind of thing. Not quite Lionel. In filthy animals, but there's some balance there between the two. Mm. Let's put it that way. But watching him sort of maneuver through the world and watching you bring in these other characters got me thinking about the introduction that you wrote for that Edith Wharton craft book, The Writing of Fiction, mm -hmm. and how Wharton is, you know, got this very specific idea of what a novel's supposed to do, right? Like it's supposed to represent how we move in the world and, and what's going on. And I feel like you play with that here in a new kind of way for you. I feel like you have a little more room to roam time-wise, story-wise, in ways that you may not have given your... And, I, and I'm taking it out of the context of the stories for a second, because obviously stories are a very specific different kind of experience right and time appears differently in stories but like if i compare this to real life you're a little looser mm. on the page am i right about that oh yeah absolutely okay. totally totally i think you know real life was this hyper focused account of one consciousness over three days maybe four depending <laughs> Um, and there were, I mean, there weren't even a lot of flashbacks in that book. It was like, so in the moment, you know, and with this book, I don't know, I wanted to write a big cast of characters and I wanted to follow them over the course of more than a couple days. I wanted to write a book that felt like it took up quite a lot of time and that you were getting to see characters change and shift and you were getting to see them like from different angles almost. And, and that was, a, that was the great pleasure of writing this book was like picking up with Seamus a couple months later and, and, and stuff like that. And I, I also feel that even within the specific like chapters, you know, it was the case that before I would like write one chapter, like one chapter in real life is basically like six hours right. and one story in filthy animals for the most part, they're like a handful of hours as well. And with this book, even in the chapters, you know, sometimes weeks go by, sometimes months go by, sometimes a day goes by, sometimes a night. And so it was fun to play with different time signatures, even within the different chapters and each character sort of moving at some points through quite a lot of time, like with Theodore's chapter, yeah. and then not a lot of time, right? But then if you take a step back and you look at the way time functions across the book as a whole, even yeah. though each chapter moves forward a certain number of hours, that time is accounted for within the whole book. So that if it's going to be October when one chapter ends, it's October when the next chapter begins, right? And it 
keeps time. And that was the thing that also felt very important to me is this temporal unity so that even while I was playing with time, the reader felt like the book as a whole had accumulated Mm -hmm. a passage of time. Especially when it's sitting in conversation with filthy animals. I mean, the the Charlie, Lionel, Sophie stories, there are three of them or four? Well, there are three characters, but I think there are four four or five stories. Stories all happen within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, they started and, you know, the first time I read it, I was like, wait a minute, I had to, I had to actually go back. I was like, oh, okay. I mean, that compression, it was kind of eye-poppingly great, right? Like, it's not (laughs) something that you always get. And here, I was just kind of like, I was not necessarily looking for the time signatures. I was just aware that time moved differently in this book. And I kind of love that. I kind of love not knowing, like, you know, it's a little bit like to the lighthouse, right? That Virginia Woolf, where it's like, Mm. sometimes, you know, there are bits of the book where it's like, 15 minutes pass and 10 pages later, or, you know, it's weeks and months and she plays with time in a similar way. And I mean, obviously you, in a novel, you can play with time in a way that you can't play with it in a story, right? Mm -hmm. Like more, more happens, whatever that more might be. Maybe you're cutting back in time, you're cutting forward in time, all that kind of thing. But when you're sitting down with a book like this, and we know you fixed the problems, right? Like you, you have your point of entry, <laughs> Seamus is fixed. Like yeah. now we're in the thick of the thing. Is writing more rewriting for you? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I feel very blessed in that I can write very quickly and mm-hmm. I can write really, really good first drafts. Okay. And, you know, and I feel like that's great. That's super. But for me, it's not enough. I feel like for me, my ambitions become clearer to me in revision and in rewriting. And so there have been cases where I've turned in, you know, like an early draft of something to my editor. And he's been like, I think this is good. We can just patch up a few things and we're good to go. And I'm always like, yeah, but are we demanding enough from this thing? And he's like, Brandon, please don't go rewrite this book again. And it became a bit of an inside joke for real life, even because, you know, the first draft of that book, we sold it. We Like I fixed nothing in the first draft of that book. And we sold it. And my editor was like, this is good to go. And I'm like, are we asking enough of, of the book? And so I love revision. I love rewriting. And I feel like my work, I feel like I'm able to pull off things that you kind of can't do in a first draft using revision. So like, you know, refining some of the, the time signatures, refining some of the, the conversations, especially. I feel like conversations are the things I love revising most because I can always sharpen up a conversation. I can always make a conversation more pointed or more like revealing. And often I've had to rewrite whole chapters because, you know, what started as me poking at one conversation turned into like this revelation that, and so then I had to account for it. And then next thing you know, the whole chapter is different, right? So I, I love revision. I love doing subsequent passes over work and kind of finding the intention of a scene or seeing if I can change my understanding of the intention or the needs of a scene and pushing it even further. So there's a moment where Goran and Timo (laughs) are essentially fighting. Timo has been a pianist sort of in a past life, right? And the way you describe it, it's just like they're laughing at each other, they're smiling, and it's over. And this is like three sentences, three very short sentences. Is that the product of revision or is that the thing that you know is coming and you're just like, oh, well, of course. I think it's a little bit of both. I think that sometimes, sometimes I'll write a first draft trying to get at that feeling. And then I'll be like, mm, it's too neat. It's too, it's too pretty. And you don't know what you can do without yet. And so that's where you go back in and you work it and you work it and you work it until you find like, actually the more devastating thing is just like (laughs) stating, stating a thing, doing it plainly. Most of the dialogue in the book has been reworked and reworked and reworked and gone over. Anytime there's an exchange of dialogue or even just like a scene where people are in conflict or confrontation. Those are scenes that I go back to again and again, and just try to make sure that it, that it feels right and natural and true. And, you know, and I feel like that's sometimes why people 
are always like, your books are too tense. They're unbearably tense. And it's because I've gone in and like taken out all the slack, all the off moments. Wait, people really say that to you? Your books are too tense? Yeah, yes, yeah. Especially with real life. There was this one uh, rev- book reviewer on YouTube who reviewed my book and said, this book was so unpleasant. It was just like unbearable. It was so tense. And I was like, yeah, that is <laughs> that is the human condition. <laughs> I was like, well, you have located uh, my dramatic intention. <laughs> I don't know what to yeah, tell if, you. I mean, so here's the thing. When I'm reading, I mean, and I know I mentioned this earlier, I don't necessarily need to like characters, but I need, mm. you know, stuff to happen. I need them to, you know, iterate however they're going to, whatever the change is going to be. I need something to happen to them, as it were. And it doesn't necessarily have to be plot. It can all be internal. To sit in the interiority of all of these characters... I mean, I feel like I'm eavesdropping on these people when I'm reading your stuff. I don't feel tense about it. I just want to know what they're going to do next. And I'm kind of hoping it's not a stupid thing. And yet I'm fully prepared for someone to make (laughs) not a great choice. (laughs) You know, I mean, they're young. They're not. I mean, Bert's just Bert, but I mean. Bert is Bert is is forever young in his heart, I guess. I mean, that is the thing about my books. I feel like (laughs) people are not always making wise choices. Very seldom are they making wise choices. And I love that. I love that as a writer. I love it when a character makes a choice that you can imagine a person making that choice, even though you're just like, I would never. <laughs> it's like, you had a choice here. Oof. I, that's partially why I read. It's like, well, I didn't do the crazy thing. Someone else picked a crazy thing. Um, you know, the other day, and actually, it was probably only a couple of days ago, you had picked up Curtis Sittenfeld's latest novel, Romantic Comedy, and I've also just re- recently read it, but you were having an issue with one of the main characters, Sally. Without you putting too much context around it, I sort of, I knew, I knew which decisions you were referring to. Mm-hmm. And again, we don't, we don't want to spoil someone else's novel in this conversation either, but watching you tweet in what I assumed was kind of real time, knowing the beats that you were bumping your head up against, I was like, see? Plenty yeah. of people make bad decisions in fiction. Oh, all yeah. The time. All the time. Oh, Sally is one of the great modern characters because mm-hmm. her choices are so enraging. I think when I finished that book, I tweeted something like, this book was maddening, enraging. It made me furious and unwell. 10 out of 10. I loved every moment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, that's, but that's exactly it. I mean, mm-hmm. I just, you know, I had a couple of moments with the, the Noah in that novel too, where I was like, is this guy too perfect? And then he'd do something. I'm like, oh no, he's not. Okay, good. Yeah, I <laughs> Thank loved, you. I loved, I love that character because he is just such a, he's such a himbo. I love, mm-hmm. perfect himbo example. I, oh, Kurt, that novel is so delightful. Kurt is really one of her best for sure. <laughs> but it flows and it flows because people make bad decisions. And I don't, yes. I really don't want to read a novel where the characters are perfect and their lives are perfect. And you know, I would also not like plot only and no interesting stuff happening. I'm, mm-hmm. By interesting stuff, I mean all of the, you know, psychological and evolutionary kind of things. But you also recently read Burnham Wood by Eleanor Catton, which is a book that I love. Oh, I just, yeah. that, that book just flies. And again, like you can see some overlap between some of the characters there and some of our group from the late Americans too. And it's not necessarily just age. It really like, I don't want people walking around going, oh no, Gen Z or millennial. No, no, it's, it's people make decisions. Like, can we stop referring to 20 year olds and coming of age? Like you can have a coming of age novel and someone's 60. It just, oh, yeah. they're a little later than some, but better not than not doing it at all. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, I also think that that notion of coming of age, so I just watched the movie Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, which is a delightful, <laughs> okay. delightful movie about a woman who goes to Paris to get a Dior dress in the wake of World War II because she's recently found out that her husband is dead and he's never coming back from the war. And so she decides she wants this Dior dress, right? And she undergoes this like journey of like self-knowledge and transformation and she mm-hmm. changes. She basically like revolutionizes the house of Dior, but... I'm like, yeah, this is what it is. And, and that notion of like coming of age and that it being pegged to like young people, mm-hmm. I always feel like it's like a silly way of like trying to dress up what for most of the novel's life has just been the subject of the novel, which is like the change in one person's relationship to their self-knowledge and their self-awareness and how one resolves that to the broader world. Like 
that is the subject of Portrait of a Lady and The Wings of the Dove and literally The Age of Innocence <laughs> and The House of Mirth. And like those books are quote unquote coming of age novels as well. And I saw someone describe the late Americans as like, it's like Henry James if he was writing about a bunch of Gen Zers. And I was like, well, like Henry James was kind of writing about Gen Zers. Like, like Isabel Archer's like in her 20s. <laughs> like, like, what are we talking about here? Like, what are we doing? Like writing about people trying to figure out who they are and where they fit in the world. Like that is not a special thing to be doing. Like that is the history of the novel. That is the great Gatsby. That is Sula, by the way. That's, um, that's so many of the great novels. And I don't know. I, I always find that a little silly, this idea of like coming of age. It's like, yeah, you mean like a person waking up one day and realizing that their life is not what they thought it to be? <laughs> Regardless of what that looks like on the outside. Yeah, no. I, mean, right. I think I'm stealing the line from Jane Smiley, but, you know, novels become historical record, right? Mm -hmm. Like as stuff ages, like you look at obviously some of the novels that you just rattled off, the, the High Victorian, they're Edwardian, like, and we don't necessarily live like that, but a lot of the stuff hasn't changed. Like Trollope still writes about marriage better than some people today. And dude's yeah, been oh. dead for, I don't even know how long at this point. Like, you know, Flaubert has given us interiority in characters in a way that, you know, his peers were not necessarily doing. Like, would I rather read Trollope over Dickens? Yes, very much so. Thank you. I, the cutesy names, I can only do so much with the cutesy <laughs> names. Dickens was such a hoot, though. Dickens was really doing a different thing. I mean, I I recently read The Way We Live Now by Trollope, and yeah, like yeah. that book opens with like a woman bribing literary editors to <laughs> to blurb her book and review it, and I was just like, wow, so little plus ça change. Like the mm -hmm. it's amazing. <laughs> okay, speaking of editors, though, you're not just a writer. You've taken a gig with Unnamed Press, which is a great gang of folks. And I'm trying to figure because I think you've also bought your first book, right? You've already bought Have. something. Okay. Yes. Coming out in 23 or 24? 24. 24. Okay. Yeah. So here you are. You're on both sides of the fence, right? Mm-hmm. What's the plan for the editorial <laughs> piece? And yeah, this is totally an excuse to work unnamed into the show. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, unnamed before, you know, it's so wild. One day last year, I was sitting at my desk. I think it was right around this time, actually. And right. I got an email from Chris Heiser right. uh, and Olivia, who were then the, who were co-founders of Unnamed. And they're like, hey, can we have a call? And I was like, sure. Okay, cool. And they were like, we're looking for someone to step in as Olivia transitions to a different publishing house. We, we thought you'd be a fit. And it was so interesting because I'd been a longtime fan of Unnamed mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and a writer I had worked with um, on her manuscript had recently sold it to Unnamed and was being published by them. So there's like this great synchrony of taste mm -hmm. and an and idea. And I'd always, I mean, editing books was always a big dream of mine. It was something that I always wanted to do, which you know me, there are no publishing jobs. <laughs> like there, are, there are no publishing jobs. Um, and it's like waiting for a, a professor to die so you can get tenure. Like there's just like... Right. There are no jobs. I was like, wow, this would be great. Like this could be, this is a press I really love. I've read their books for a long, long time. It seems like it could be great. So I took the leap and signed up mm -hmm. to work with them. First week on the job, got this incredible manuscript and bought it. And I was like, wow, this is it. This is it. And so my mm -hmm. first book is called Henry Henry and it'll be out next year. And it is it's the kind of book that when you read it, you're like, oh, I can see that this is going to be someone's favorite book. You know, like there are certain books that when you read it, you're like, I know exactly who mm -hmm. would love this, right? It's queer retelling of the Henriade. It's so, it's so good. And immediately I saw in my mind, like, this is going to be a whole bunch of people's favorite book. And I, this is the kind of book that I want to publish and I want to see in the world. Um, and so I got it, you know, I thought it was going to be a, in a dog fight for it, but right. you know, it was me and we, I made an offer and they accepted. And then I was telling my UK editor about it. Cause I'm being yep. published in the UK. And the next thing I know, she swoops in and like gets it on the UK end. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this book is, yeah, this book is really special. And it was, I don't know, it's one of those things where you realize like, oh, like, you know, like I have now a voice and a venue mm -hmm. to sort of make change and to sort of pick the books that I want to read and 
that I think other people are going to love. And it's, I don't know, it feels like a magic trick, <laughs> you know? And for a long time, you know, like me and my friends would get into, we, you know, as young writers always do, they get together mm-hmm. and they complain about the state of American publishing. Mm-hmm. And we'd be like, oh, someone should publish this book because this book is so good, but they would never take a chance on it and all this mm-hmm. other stuff. And so to be able to, you know, open up my inbox one day, see a manuscript that spoke to me, then be able to sort of make it into a book that other people are going to get to read. Oh, dream come true. I mean, it's the dream job, you know? Yeah. The only thing that's better is being a bookseller. Sorry. We get to yell about a lot of stuff for a long time. You know, booksellers. <laughs> oh yes. Booksellers. Some of my favorite interactions on Twitter are like me getting like really riled up about a book mm-hmm. and then like a flotilla of booksellers being like, hello, yes, I would also love to yell <laughs> about this book. And it just, I don't know. It's so, I love booksellers. I love, I don't know. It's just, it's so magical. It's like, ah, book nerds. <laughs> book nerds. I mean, we're weird, but God, we're fun. I mean, we really mm-hmm. are. It's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, this idea that you can connect emotionally with someone who has nothing to do with you. I mean, I, I, I may have done a little stint in Chicago and, you know, that was great. It was a really long time ago. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm meant to be on a coast. Mm -hmm. It's totally fine. (laughs) But, you know, I didn't want to leave your late Americans. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I want to hang out with these guys a little more. I want to know what's going on. You know, I just, I never really want to leave the worlds that you construct, whether it's like, sometimes I'm even a little loath to leave a story behind. I'm like, I can't, well, I, I love story collections too. I really love story collections. I'm thinking of Alec actually for a second, mm. from Filthy Animals. I'm like, and I was like, wait a minute. Oh, he better come back. And you know, you do what you do, I respect. But however, if Alec were to come back, I would not be sad because I would like some answers, please. <laughs> but to be that attached, right? To a character that I have absolutely nothing in common with. On the, on the surface, right? But this life that you give him and this sort of what's next and what happens and who's his family, there's this universality to what you're doing that I really appreciate. And I think that does come actually from reading a lot of dead people. <laughs> I really think I, it's because you're, yes. reading, like you're looking for that moment. You're looking for that way to create the stickiness of that world, mm. right? And I think you kind of need to read the dead people. Yes, probably. Probably that's true. I, you know, or at least reading all the dead people helps. I mean, I, Mm -hmm. you know, Curtis's book was apart from my work as an editor. I think Mm -hmm. Curtis's book was the first contemporary book I'd read in like eight months because I'm reading all of Zola. I'm reading all of Emile Zola and he takes up a lot of space. Yes. Um, Yes, And so I've been reading a lot of Zola and James and Wharton um, and always rereading Austin. And I find myself so... Like I was rereading Persuasion a couple weeks ago and I, you know, once again got to Wentworth's letter and just found myself like so overcome. (laughs) I don't know. I just found myself so moved that like, you know, he is betting it all. He's betting it all on that letter. And I think, yeah, reading The Dead People, I do find myself really moved by those characters. And I think that that makes it, that makes me a lot less, I don't know, when people are always like, can we inhabit other minds? I'm like, are you joking? Like, I just sobbed over the plight of this like naval officer and like his <laughs> slightly aged bride. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. We, we can, it, it is all about, you know, do you honor the experience of your fellow humans or not? Like, are they people to you or not? And how do you go about creating that on the page ethically and morally and honestly? Mm-hmm. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I am interested in I don't know. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in humans. All my characters are people to me first. Um, and I love writing them all. And yeah, I, I don't know. I find that kind of magical that we can pick up a book from hundreds of years ago and just like <laughs> laugh along and cackle and cry for them. And um, like Ralph Touchett saying to Isabel Archer, like, no matter what else you, you've been despised, whatever, you've also been loved. Like that has no business moving me in the back of an on a lift on the way to Brooklyn. Like, and yet <laughs> I'm like crying in a lift on the way to Brooklyn, thinking about Ralph Touchett. And I think like that is, I don't know, that's like a magical part of literature. And so that maybe is the thing I'm after in my writing is I want to write things that feel like the books I love and the books I love happen to be, you know, Turgenev and, <laughs> and James and Wharton. Are you reading for character first? I think so, but it's a very... 
I think it's a very particular idea of character. Mm, I think okay. when I'm reading, I, I want a sense that the writer has attended to not just like the character and their personality traits, but the furthest extent of those personality traits. So like a character who's like cranky, like I don't want you just to give me like three details about how they're cranky. Like how has that crankiness informed their entire life? And how can you give me at a glance the full extent of those ramifications? And I feel like, you know, the 19th century novelists were really good at that. <laughs> they were really good at telling, like you kind of know from someone's couch cushion what kind of person they are in those 19th century novels. Whereas novels today, I feel like character has turned into something much gauzier and flimsier. And I feel like even in character-driven novels, I, I often don't leave with a strong sense of who those people are. I feel like consequence has been severed from character in some way. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, it's kind of like, well, there are times where I've been reading and I would think, you know, not only do I not know why this person is doing this thing, I'm not sure the writer does either. And yet nothing happens because these decisions, like, it's just, I'm kind of like, so why are we here? Mm. Right? Like, I don't need constant plot, right? I don't need set piece after set piece after set piece after set piece to move us through. But I need to be invested in some sort of outcome. And, you know, outcomes require consequences. <laughs> like, there has to be something at stake, right? And it can't just be like, stuff happens to me. It's like, well, stuff doesn't just happen to you. <laughs> like, you make choices. You do, th like, you make decisions. And yeah, you know, we're, we're messy creatures, human beings. Like, we just, yeah. for the most part, we don't often get it. So messy. And like, that's the fun of it. Yeah, you know, I am big on, I taught a class for Center for Fiction on consequences. I am a firm believer in consequences. And that is, you know, like that is the thing that I find myself impressing the most on my students mm -hmm. is consequences. And a lot of the way that that manifests, at least in younger writers work, mm -hmm. is the scenes end very quickly. Yeah. And I'm always telling them, linger, mm -hmm. linger longer, like stay in this moment longer because you have left before anything has been acknowledged, right. resolved, or even noted. Like you have to linger longer. And so, yeah, I mean, consequences is a big thing, I think, in my own work in that I'm down to follow a character down any decision path, but mm -hmm. like we've got to, you've got to at least follow through on the decisions. Like I'm not interested in a series of like, airily described rooms while a character thinks about something in the distant past unless like those thoughts have some consequence right. in the present i'm just not as a reader interested in those sorts of things that is the thing i find myself harping on the most in my students work anyway it's like guys we gotta have consequences we gotta we gotta stay in this moment long enough for the moment to lead to something have we tripped ourselves up i mean we see a lot of for want of a better phrase therapy speak like are we using that to not feel the things we need to feel in order to linger as you say you know linger at the end of the scene linger i mean part of why i read is to not always be comfortable mm. right like i want to mm. be challenged a little bit i want to have to think a little bit i want to be judgy I'm mm. frequently very judgy. <laughs> and, you know, that's part of the fun of it. It's like, well, of course I wouldn't do that. And it's like, well, actually last Tuesday, mm. I did something markedly, stupidly similar because I'm human, you know, and, and just this idea that we're, we're keeping our distance in a way that like is kind of laughable. Cause if you think about it, like Edith Wharton didn't have a lot of language to describe certain states of being, right? Like we hadn't even invented those words when she was writing, right? And now it's kind of like, well, if I can find the words to describe the situation, then I don't have to feel it. I don't have to experience it. And I can just mm. plop it here and sort of walk away. And yeah. we end up with these kind of not fraudulent moments, but cheesy. Slightly yeah. Cheesy. Yeah. The thing that I encounter most in um, workshop settings anyway, mm -hmm is like, let's say a character has had some, often it's some formative trauma or there's some difficult thing in their life. The writer doesn't ever acknowledge the thing and everything is like very evasive around the thing. And so in workshop, someone will say, 
I just found it odd that that there's obviously something going on, but it's never broached in the text. And often the writer will say, well, I mean, that's what people who are experiencing that go through. Like she doesn't want to think about it. And so writers will recreate, <laughs> they will just not acknowledge the thing because like that is what the character would do. And I'm just like, well, the thing about that is that's life. Life is not narrative. <laughs> like life is not a novel. And in a novel, it's not sufficient. A story, it is not sufficient to do that. Like if a character is trying desperately to look away from something, they've got to be looking at something. Like what is the thing that they have substituted that for? And you still feel the impression of the absence and the absence is still very much felt, but you've got to sort of do the work to imbue the other things with that missing component. And I think people just don't know how to dramatize like that particular aspect of like trauma or aversion or repulsion. And I feel like in my own work, I'm like, well, yeah, you don't like, it's scary, but as a writer, you have to lean into those moments of fear. And I'm not saying you have to like re-traumatize yourself, but like in my own work, like all the time, like with the example of Wallace from real life, that mm -hmm. scene where he says that thing at the dinner party, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the first draft of that dinner party, he didn't say anything. And I was like, well, that's not very interesting. And I was like, well, I know the thing that he should not say, but I can't mm -hmm. write that because if I write that, I won't know what to write next. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, that is, that is the job, Brandon Taylor. Like you have <laughs> to just do that. And so I think what I find myself trying to challenge my students to do is to write up to the precipice and leap, like don't walk away from it. Like do the thing that is going to upset all your carefully laid plans. And that is going to force you to line by line, have to invent the thing you need. Like you can't always want to be comfortable and neat. Like it's a draft, like make some mistakes, like break some eggs, you know, like right. have the courage to, to follow through. And I think that that's ultimately what we get is a lot of there's a lot of aversion in the writing, which mm -hmm. is fine for the character, but it is not fine for the story, I think. Right. I mean, isn't the whole point of a novel to provide context to a situation? I mean, isn't that essentially what you're doing? I mean, your relationships with other characters, the, the decisions you make, the things you do, all of this, I mean, it's all context to a life, right? Well, well. That's what I mean, they used to think. That's what they thought okay, until the postmodernists came along and ruined the novel. <laughs> but yeah. That's a whole I mean, other I think, conversation. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Let's Sorry, not. That's a whole other let's, conversation. Let's not blow up the, the, the context here. No, I agree. I think like for me, um, I think it was D.H. Lawrence who said that the novel is the greatest invention man has for mm -hmm. articulating the subtle interrelatedness of things. And like that to me is very much the kind of novel I want to write, which... Right like captures how complicated these networks of relations are. And a novel is all about context for me. But I think it's also just part of this broader trend of the fact that like contemporary narrators do not have sufficient explanatory power to power novels. Like they just don't. Like narrators can't describe things anymore. They can't tell you what kind of person anybody is anymore. <laughs> like narrators are just there to like kind of describe quite close to the skin of the character, kind of like what the room temperature is and what three things they had for breakfast or lunch. Like the, the, that's all the narrator can do in contemporary fiction these days. And it's just like, I need more. I need, I need a narrator who can like describe things, all the things, all of it. Without leaning into brand names, but that's a whole second conversation. Yes, that that is that we that is for the Didion portion of the convo. It's a whole nother. But I have a th like brand names do not help me. They do not. No, like, I just they really. That is not the context. I like. I get it. You're trying to set up X, Y, and Z thing, but it yeah, it doesn't float my boat. It doesn't. It do no. And I I think part of that is like we have lost. Listen. Symbols have lost their power to signify. We got rid of the common culture. Those brands mean nothing. <laughs> That's all. We keep Again, getting dangerously close are. to these segues where I'm like, we could go for like an hour on this. And that then is we this, could go that, for another hour after that. Miwa, we could have a whole podcast about that one idea. Uh, yes, we could actually. We really, really, really could. But I knew this was going to happen and I knew we were going to bump up against time. What's next 
for you? I mean, obviously, we've got late Americans. This is airing right as the book is coming out. There will be touring again. There will be all sorts of stuff. But like, have you started the next thing? Well, the next thing that's under contract is a novel called Group Show, which is a novel about a Midwestern art museum. And it's what I consider like the last of my Midwestern quartet. Like I think of these first four books as belonging to like a quartet. And like for reasons that are perhaps obvious, they even have, they share characters and locations. And so that book will be next. Um, And then, you know, I'm wrapping up some film and TV stuff, Mm -hmm. finish the real life script. There's a big, big world out there for these stories, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Yeah, no, there there definitely is. (laughs) There definitely is. We're happy to help get the word out. We're happy to help keep putting these books into people's hands because, I mean, you do some cool stuff here. You do some very, very cool, kind of old fashioned in the right sense of the word, like not, Mm. you know, I just sometimes you just want to be told a story and you just want to see what happens. And it's always really fun when you're the guy telling the story. Brandon Taylor, thank you so much. The Late Americans is out now. If you haven't somehow read Filthy Animals or Real Life yet, go get those two. Thank you. Hi, readers, it's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of great books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of The Late Americans. I'm Mark. I'm here at my Barnes & Noble store in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by my book buddy, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Hi, Mark. I'm Jamie. I am in my Barnes & Noble in Leawood, Kansas. So I am very excited for anything that Brandon Taylor puts out. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in first. Just thinking about this book, just maybe think about personal stories and memory and groups of characters who all support or harm each other. And it made me think of a fantastic book I read a few years back called Ohio by Stephen Markley. Woof. This book is crushing, but in a great way. It's about a group of high school classmates who are returning to their hometown six years after high school. Uh, If you remember the 80s movie, The Big Chill, you're kind of in the right realm for experiencing this novel. You follow uh, Bill, Stacy, Dan, and Tina. Oh, dear God, Tina who each have their own reasons for returning home and who each also have their own narrative that the readers get to follow. The ways that their pasts and presents uh, intertwine with each other is pretty heartbreaking. This is not the kindest book in the world. You will ache for these people in very different ways, but it is also very honest, which is really needs to happen for a book like this. It needs to really tell the truth. It does it well. And it's beautifully written. It's a recollection of small towns that have eroded. It is a look at the sort of tenuous but never breaking tie between your high school self and your adult self and how that should be severed sometimes. But there's those things that sort of hold on. And it's also about the things that are left unsaid that could really ruin someone. It's an excellent book. I highly recommend. So pick up Ohio by Stephen Markley. Jamie, what do you have for us? Uh, That is a fantastic choice, Mark. (laughs) Nice. Okay. So I think in the same sort of vein a little bit, if you, I think if you enjoy these books where you're talking about found families and the people that you choose to spend your life with, and not just the ones that you are born into, right? I think you'd also enjoy All of This Could Be Different by Sarah Thunkham Matthews, um, who actually was on a Port Over episode last summer when this book came out. This was a novel that was on our um, Discover Prize, uh, our prize for debut authors shortlist last year. It was on a lot of best of 2022 book lists. And like uh, Brandon Taylor, one of the things that a lot of us uh, who got to read it really loved was the fantastic prose. It's really a fresh voice. It's beautifully written, but it's also sexy and funny and smart. And to your point with the Stephen Markley book, it is very, very honest book. While it's refreshing and new, it also has that familiarity because it's it feels so true. I'm always really excited to read a debut novel that has something new to say, and and especially one that does it well. That's like two thumbs up from me. <laughs> so uh, the story uh, centers around um, Sneetha, who is an Indian woman. She's recently graduated. She's living and working in Milwaukee. 
And it's about the deep friendships that she forges during this, you know, your early 20s here, right after this is your this is your formative time of early adulthood. And um, we all go through these universal experiences that she's describing in the novel of figuring out who we are and who we want to spend our lives with um, in, in terms of friends and lovers. And Sneha is removed from her family, um, obviously, geographically. They, in the story, have uh, been, one of them has been deported back to India. Her father has for a crime he didn't commit, and then her mother has followed. And so she's separated from her family geographically, but she's also really sees this big widening divide between her and them culturally. She starts dating women at the time of this novel. She's not making the traditional decisions that her family expects from her. So she's constantly sort of afraid that she's failing them, not living up to their expectations, but also wanting to be true to herself. She can't really figure out, you know, office politics at work or how to get ahead there. She can't figure out her crazy landlord that she has. Um, So she's going through a lot. She's going through a rough time. As she goes on, she learns she has to really rely on her friend group. And so Sarah Thanka Matthews um, really writes these friends with the same kind of care that she writes her main character. It's Sneha and her work buddy, Tom. It's her ex-boyfriend, Amit. It is her first girlfriend, (laughs) Marina. And uh, her new uh, BFF, Tig, which is short for Antigone, who's a great character and whose ideas really inform um, the second half of the book where they decide you know what, we're not going to do what everybody expects us to do. We're going to break a lot of rules and try something new. So anyway, I love it. It's a great friendship book. And I guarantee you have not read this friendship book before, though. Uh, And I don't want to get into a lot of intricacies of the plot because it just really, it unfolds beautifully and uh, really refreshingly. So I hate to spoil it. And again, that was, all this could be different. (laughs) Oh, fantastic choice. And yeah, you're right. Like just the way that she approaches this group of friends, I could read a book about each of the characters separately. The same with Ohio, too, even though, woof, a little <laughs> less, like, I know, there, there's, some rough, there's some rough stuff in this book, too. There's definitely yeah. some tough, tough moments. But definitely. Yeah. But that is all the time we have for today. Thanks so much for tuning in to Port Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Jamie. You can follow my home store at BN Leewood KS. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.